It's early in the hours of April 4th, 1912, and tied up alongside Southampton's new deepwater dock is the even newer luxury liner RMS Titanic. She's just completed her first real voyage, the delivery trip from her builders at Belfast. Trials completed, and all well, Titanic has been handed over to her new owners, and now she must do the job that she was designed for, cross the mighty Atlantic Ocean with hundreds aboard. For the next few days before the departure on April 10th, feverish preparations will need to be made. Coal bunkers topped up with hundreds of tons of Welsh anthracite, hundreds more tons of pieces of meat, fruit and vegetables, thousands and thousands of bottles of beer, wine and spirits. Inside, the paint still smells fresh. The next days will be frantic, but for now, gleaming like a new penny in the moonlight, Titanic sits and rocks gently at her moorings. The story of Titanic is perhaps most well known for its ending, the image of the tragic loss of the liner taking with it nearly 1500 souls into the freezing depths of the North Atlantic has been seared into our collective memory for over 100 years. Tragedy is what most people think of when they hear the name Titanic, but this of course is only part of the story because the Titanic that existed before the early morning hours of April 15th, 1912 was a very different ship. In truth, Titanic was a liner like any other, albeit larger and grander than most. Her early days were fraught with frenzied final touches and inspections as the last minute preparations were made for what should have been a routine yet hopeful maiden voyage. Today, we'll be looking at the ship as she was in her very brief heyday, in the final days leading up to her departure from Southampton on her way to her date with destiny, a moment in time where there was still pride and hope for Titanic. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is the story of Titanic before disaster. Construction on Titanic was started in March of 1909, and by May 31st, 1911, the ship was officially launched, sliding gracefully stern first down the ways into the River Lagan, as a crowd of enthusiastic onlookers gathered to celebrate the birth of the largest moving object yet built. This, of course, was just the beginning of her journey, brief though it was, and her impact on history would be felt for generations to come. Her first stop would be to a fitting outberth in Belfast, where the workers of Highland and Wolfe would fill the empty husk of her hull with machinery, fixtures, furnishings, and all manner of shipboard necessities and amenities. Ideally, this process would take between seven and eight months, which is the amount of time it took to complete Olympics fitting out. But work delays suffered as a result of Olympic's collision with the cruiser HMS Hawk in 1911 required the maiden voyage of Titanic to be pushed back by about three months. The White Star Line, Titanic's owners, felt it more important to repair the damaged Olympic and return her to service, with Titanic's maiden voyage being delayed. Now, having already been postponed once, Titanic would need to wait yet another month to officially see herself in service when Olympic again caused a delay to her sister, this time by losing a propeller blade during a crossing. The final push leading up to Titanic's departure would be something of a mad dash to the finish line. Amidst the parade of finishing touches and last minute changes in the final weeks of Titanic's completion, the ship's officers began to arrive in Belfast to settle in and learn the ins and outs of the vessel they were to help command. The first of these crew members to arrive were Chief Officer William Murdoch, First Officer Charles Lightoller, and Second Officer David Blair. The trio arrived on March 20th of 1912, having already served alongside one another across the White Star Line fleet, so there was a natural sense of camaraderie between the three. In fact, Lightoller would later on say that the three were a trio of very contented chaps, each excited to serve in senior roles aboard the newest and finest liner in the world. Murdoch hailed from a long line of seafarers, and as a Royal Navy Reserve officer, he had the experience and the qualifications necessary to serve as the highest ranking officer in the ship's crew below the captain. Almost a decade prior to Titanic, Murdoch, while serving as a second officer on board the Arabic, prevented a near imminent collision with a sailing ship that only his keen eye was able to spot in the darkness. In fact, Murdoch reportedly shoved the ship's quartermaster out of the way of the ship's wheel to prevent an incorrect course change that would have steered the vessel straight into disaster. 
Now, after having served as a first officer on board RMS Adriatic, and then Titanic's slightly older sister ship, Olympic, for much of her 1911 season, Murdoch had learned he was finally going to join Titanic on her maiden voyage as chief officer, an assignment that was both an honour and a career highlight. Following Murdoch onto the ship was first officer Charles Lightoller. Like Murdoch, Lightoller, nicknamed Lights by his friends and colleagues aboard ships, came from an experienced background in shipping. Lightoller was known to be a sharp and highly experienced company man with a playful, quirky sense of humour. He was not above the occasional prank on his fellow crew members, and his rather spirited antics had actually landed him in hot water with captains in the past. One particular event in the middle of the Boer War saw him sneak onto an Australian fort, fire a blank charge from a cannon that was on the top, and then quickly escape after leaving behind a Boer flag. The gag drew the ire of the Australian authorities, made the papers, and was described as a, quote, foolish and mad brain business. Despite this, who was a long-time trusted associate of White Star Line's famed Captain Edward John Smith, whom he had served under aboard Majestic. Lightoller's aptitude for quick thinking and cool-headedness meant that he was a reliable and steadfast seaman, and with numerous ships already under his belt, he was the natural choice for the first officer of White Star Line's newest ship. Second Officer David Blair, or Davy to his fellow officers, had been recently reassigned from the White Star Liner Teutonic, and despite the years of sailing under his belt, letters and postcards sent home reveal a deep sense of pride at his having joined Titanic, a ship four times the size of his previous assignment. As the officers made themselves at home aboard ship, preparations aboard Titanic kept up their frantic pace, because very soon she'd need to prove herself out on the open water as part of her sea trials. A week later, after Murdoch, Lightoller and Blair had arrived, the three senior officers were joined by the four junior ones. Third Officer Pittman hailed from a farming family and actually joined the Merchant Navy when he was just 17. He had joined the White Star Line five years prior to 1912, and he came fresh from the RMS Oceanic. Being an avid stamp collector, he actually took his collection with him aboard Titanic. Fourth Officer Joseph Boxall was known as a quiet, self-contained and cerebral man who, like Murdoch, came from a seafaring family, and his father had been a captain in the Wilson Line. He joined the White Star Line just four years prior, and came from SS Arabic. Fifth Officer Harold Lowe was a stranger to all. He hadn't served with any of his fellow officers before, while Pittman, Boxall and Moody all had served together on the RMS Oceanic before in 1911. Lowe was from North Wales, although he'd lost his Welsh accent, at age 14, he ran away from home after his father wished him to follow an unpaid apprenticeship. Lowe was known for his emphatic language, which tended to give the others the impression of something of a hothead. He'd joined the White Star Line nearly a year prior, and he was taken from the SS Belgic. The youngest of the quartet of junior officers was James Moody, who was just 24. This jolly Yorkshireman had his naval training on board HMS Conway in 1902 and had served most of his career on sailing ships being thrown about round in Cape Horn. Known to be lively and witty, Moody had only joined the White Star Line the previous August, where he was assigned to the RMS Oceanic as her sixth officer. Despite applying for leave to go on holiday in France with an American friend, it was denied by the White Star Line. Disappointed, he had exclaimed, we can't have big ships and holidays. At Belfast, a steady stream of characters came aboard, those who would see Titanic perform on her sea trials and serve aboard her throughout the maiden voyage and her first transatlantic season. One of these was the ship's surgeon, Dr. William O'Loughlin, a well-respected and kindly Irishman who had found favour with almost everyone he met. O'Loughlin had previously remarked to Captain Smith that after some 40 years of seafaring, he was done being transferred from one ship to another, and Smith in response, had teased him for being lazy and told the surgeon to pack his things and join him aboard Titanic. Whether it was his loyalty to his old friend or his people-pleasing nature, O'Loughlin relented and dutifully became part of the ship's crew on her maiden voyage. At the same time as O'Loughlin was settling into his comfortable cabin, two other very important figures stepped onto the gangway for the first time. These men were Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, Titanic's two Marconi wireless officers. The pair filled a unique position, being employed not by the White Star Line like the rest of the crew, but by the Marconi International Marine Company. The pair had actually never met before their first day on Titanic, but fell into step with one another quickly enough, 
especially given their exciting new position complete with a state-of-the-art Marconi set. Back then, the wireless operators were a pioneering group, having attended many of the same schools to learn their trade. It's actually a little bit unusual that Phillips and Bride had never crossed paths before, as operators became well known to one another, and they'd frequently tease and curse at each other over the airwaves. Like Olympics, the Marconi set found on Titanic was second to none, with a vastly wider range than any other ships of the time, and far easier on the ears to boot. Most wireless systems in this era were known for producing a harsh, grating tone, but these newer sets generated a far more melodic, pleasing sound, making those hours-long shifts much more bearable. Phillips and Bride were undoubtedly enamoured with the new technology they were going to use, but there was work to be done first. Rigorous equipment testing needed to be completed, shifts and watches needed to be organised, and the two needed to make sure they were comfortable with using this brand new machine. And as with everything in these final days, there was anxiety and excitement in equal measure. While the crew began to settle in, there was still much to do before the ship was even ready for her sea trials. In the final days of March 1912, about a week before the planned series of tests could be run, both formal and informal inspections were completed to ensure the ship's life-saving equipment was up to snuff. Officers Lowe, Moody, Pittman and Boxall were all ordered to complete a thorough inspection of all the lifeboats under the supervision of First Officer Lightoller. Francis Carruthers, the shipyard surveyor of the British Board of Trade, who was tasked with overseeing the construction of Titanic, was brought on board to officially test out everything from the ship's lifeboats to her mammoth anchors. All 16 of her main 30-foot boats were swung out, lowered, and then hauled back up that huge 10-story drop from the boat deck, and Carruthers meticulously inspected the strength of the boats and the fancy new style of well and lifeboat davit that they hung from. A similar procedure was followed with the central auxiliary anchor, which was hauled up from the forecastle deck, hooked up to a crane, swung out and then brought back in. Once everything was deemed satisfactory, Carruthers signed off on the ship, deeming Titanic fit to carry passengers, with all the necessary safety regulations in place. It was a result that surprised no one. Harland and Wolfe were one of the finest shipbuilders in the world. With just a week to go until Titanic steamed out for her trials, she received her first real commander, and it wasn't Captain Smith. Captain Herbert Haddock, recently arrived from his previous posting aboard the White Star Liner Oceanic, took charge of the soon-to-be-completed Titanic in anticipation of the trials. But as he settled in, the first order of business would be to acquaint himself with the imposing new ship he was to oversee, which was nearly three times larger than his previous command. To take charge of such a behemoth, even for such a brief time, must have been an intimidating prospect for Haddock, but with 20 years' experience as a commander, he showed no apprehension and began to oversee the preparations. As April arrived, so too did Titanic's chief engineer, Joseph Bell. Bell was a Wyatt Starline veteran, and his judgement was deemed so valuable that he'd actually assisted in overseeing the construction of Olympic and Titanic's engine rooms. When Olympic had been introduced, it was Bell that saw her engines worked up through the maiden voyage. What better a professional could be called upon to do the same for Titanic? It was his job to oversee the function of the ship's massive and complex hybrid power plant, as well as supervising a crew of engineers, electricians, stokers, trimmers, and more, equating to some 300 men all working to keep the ship's machinery humming along. As with both Olympic and Titanic, it was planned that after the maiden voyage was complete, Bell would return to Belfast to oversee the completion of the machinery for the third and final ship in the Olympic class, the yet-to-be-completed liner, Britannic. By the start of April, the fitting out of RMS Titanic was complete. While there was still plenty of work to be done, and finishing touches to be made throughout, by all accounts the ship's major systems were functioning, and she was officially ready to take on her sea trials. The final formality before she set off for Southampton. This day was also marked by the arrival of the ship's official master, Captain Edward J. Smith, or EJ as he was more commonly known, who had relieved Captain Haddock of his mainly symbolic duties at the ship's helm. Haddock's assignment hadn't actually been in vain though, he would be replacing Smith as skipper of RMS Olympic, and his stint on Titanic, even tied up alongside the fitting out wharf, had ensured that he could quickly get the bearings of his new command once he stepped aboard. Smith was extremely experienced, a trusted commander and Royal Navy Reserve officer. He'd already served on some 10 White Star vessels prior to Titanic, half of which he'd captained. 
But even before then, he'd done his time in steamers and even sailing ships where he'd started out as a sailor rounding Cape Horn. The sea was in his blood. And when the Boer War had broken out, he'd commanded RMS Oceanic as a troop ship. In fact, most of Titanic's officers were Royal Navy Reserve men. It meant that Titanic, under Smith's command, could fly the respected Blue Duster, the blue version of the British merchant ensign flag at the ship's stern, marking her commander, officers and crew out as distinguished. Smith was well liked among his crew, but even more so by his passengers. The captain's job, back then, as well as it is today, was also very social. The commander was something of an ambassador for the line. He'd be expected to attend a great many social events, to lead the Sunday services, to mingle at parties and dinners. And many captains balked at this duty and they hated it, but Smith reveled in it. He was jovial, friendly, and he had even garnered a following of loyal passengers who preferred to sail with the so-called millionaire's captain. Smith was the obvious choice as captain for Titanic's maiden crossing, and as Olympic's former master, he felt right at home at the helm of Titanic. With sailing day quickly approaching, no one was keen for any more delays thanks to Olympic's clumsy interruptions. But then, on April 1st, the day of Titanic's scheduled trials, high winds and a rough sea forced one final postponement. The trials would have to wait for another 24 hours, and the crowd of gathered spectators had to withdraw disappointed. But fortunately, they wouldn't have to wait long. The next day, April 2nd, 1912, conditions had eased, and Titanic, her boilers heated and smoke gently pouring from her third funnel, was virtually champing at the bit to show what she could do. The crew began to arrive on board from 4am, and an air of excitement enveloped the ship. The chefs and the victualling staff set about preparing the first meal that would ever be served on board, which would mirror closely the dining option for first-class passengers. At the same time, workers from the shipyard hammered away, installing carpeting and other final touches on the ship's interior spaces, and Titanic's machinery seemed to hum with anticipation as the engineers brought her to life for the very first time. Chief among those taking their places aboard ahead of her trials was Thomas Andrews, the ship's master shipbuilder, the naval engineer who likely needed to be everywhere at once on this especially busy morning. It was his job to see to it that everything was in order as per Harland and Wolfe's specifications and make note of any changes that needed to be made prior to sailing day. Andrews had worked with other Harland and Wolfe officials like William Peary and Alexander Carlyle to lay out Olympic and Titanic on the drawing board, but when Carlyle left the company in 1910, Andrews replaced him as master shipbuilder for the yard. Olympic and Titanic were Andrews' absolute obsession. One night, as Titanic sat high on the stocks ready for her launch, he had taken his young wife to stare up at the magnificent sight below the stars. Andrews would be watching Titanic's performance carefully because it would reflect directly on he and the 14,000 Irish shipbuilders under his kindly supervision. The sea trials of a ship mark a special occasion where, at the end of the agreed-upon manoeuvres, if performance is proved to be satisfactory, then the ship is to be formally handed over from builder to owner. The Harland and Wolf shipyard was well represented on board, but so too with the future owners of the vessel, the White Star Line. Unfortunately, the man who had dreamt it all up couldn't make it. Joseph Bruce Ismay, the managing director of the line, was with his family following his eldest daughter's marriage. In his place was Harold Sanderson, the line's general manager and vice president of the massive International Mercantile Marine Trust, which effectively owned the White Star Line. He too would be anxiously looking on to ensure this new mammoth vessel would do credit to his company. First, Titanic would need to prove herself. At around 6am, with hundreds of onlookers once again having assembled to catch a glimpse of the magnificent liner, Titanic cast off down the Victoria Channel for the first time under her own power and with tugs standing too. Francis Carruthers, the British Board of Trade inspector, joined the party of White Star and Harland and Wolfe officials on the bridge as the liner steamed into the North Channel. Trials would not be as rigorous or lengthy as those undertaken by Olympic the year before. Being of a near identical design, it was expected that the Titanic would fare similarly to her sister. But despite this, Carruthers still made sure the new liner was put through her paces. Against the measured mile, the ship's speed and acceleration were tested, as well as her manoeuvrability with and without her turbine engine. The engines thundering, smoke tearing from the enormous funnels, Titanic raced through the water, cutting it apart in great white swathes. Then Titanic heeled hard over, 
as Carruthers ordered a test of the ship's steering. Titanic steamed in huge full circles with the rudder half, then full over and her engines racing ahead or slowing right down. Then came the emergency stop test, a real nail biter for her builders. With the engines roaring and the ship surging ahead forward at 18 knots, suddenly the order was rung down for the engines to stop and then run full astern. Deep in the ship's bowels, Chief Engineer Joseph Bell set his men to work. Enormous strain was put on the thrust blocks down in the engine room as the propeller thrust reversed and the triple expansion steam engines shuddered. Titanic visibly began to slow and within just over three minutes, she came to a dead stop, rising gently with the swell as her builders breathed a quiet sigh of relief. Titanic had covered just 3,000 feet in the process, just shy of a kilometre, or what equated to about three and a half times her own length, which was a very impressive feat for a liner of her size. While Titanic was put through her paces, other tests were going on. Jack Phillips and Harold Bride spent the duration of those trials hard at work in the Marconi cabin, ensuring that all of their equipment was fine-tuned and operating properly, with many of the other crew members completing final tests of their own equipment and seeing to it that the ship was as ready as she ever would be. All on board agreed the Titanic handled her tests wonderfully, and upon returning to Belfast, Carruthers officially signed off on Titanic's trials, granting her a certificate of seaworthiness, which was valid for one year. Titanic was ready. Finally, having watched as her steel skeleton had slowly risen from the Belfast Yard to tower over the skyline through the course of three years, the White Star Line officially took ownership of Titanic, and now the next stop for the ship and her crew would be Southampton. While Carruthers left the ship, Andrews would stay on. In fact, he and a select few from the shipyard known as the Guarantee Group would remain aboard Titanic for a maiden voyage to oversee the ship's safe handling and make sure that all was well. Andrews wrote to his wife Nellie to say, Just a line to let you know that we got away this morning in fine style and have had a very satisfactory trial. We're getting more ship shape every hour, but there's still a great deal to be done. With the trials behind her, Titanic at last flew the White Star Line's flag proudly from her mainmast. It signalled the start of her very first voyage, and in these final hours at Belfast, workers hurriedly rushed last-minute necessities on board, like supplies for the galley, chairs and bed linen. Amidst the hustle and bustle, Titanic's first official passenger came aboard, 61-year-old Vikov Vanderhoef, a first-class passenger on his way home to New York after visiting his sister in Belfast. He was Titanic's only paid passenger on what was otherwise a delivery trip to Southampton. For the next day, Vanderhoef would have Titanic's palatial first-class public rooms virtually all to himself. Harland and Wolf's guarantee group stepped aboard too, made up of a diverse range of specialities like draftsmen, the foremen of the yard, joiners, electricians and engineers. One by one, the workers, who'd been rushing to get Titanic's finishing touches in place, left down the gangway to leave their ship behind them for the final time. Now, if they were ever to step aboard again, it would have to be during a refit or as paying passengers. At around 9pm on April 2nd, 1912, Titanic slowly steamed away from Belfast Lock, the lights of the city that built her fading away into the distance. The workers responsible for every plate, rivet, fitting and fixture watched in bittersweet satisfaction as their creation disappeared beyond the horizon. Titanic was bound for Southampton. Titanic's first real voyage, that is her brief journey into Southampton, went off without a hitch. The weather seemed to cooperate, and Marconi messages coming through throughout the voyage congratulated Titanic on the success of her trials. The ship thundered along at a cracking 23 and a quarter knots, a full two knots quicker than was anticipated, as though she was delighted for her opportunity to finally ply the waves. Of course, despite the ship having been widely considered to be complete, a naval architect's work is never really done. During this brief voyage, Thomas Andrews was a busy man indeed, compiling notes and reports on work that still needed to be refined. The short trip gave all of them a glimpse at how Titanic would perform under normal sailing conditions, and allowed the crew to turn their attention to the smallest of details that might have been overlooked. Onwards, Titanic steamed, her knife-like bow cutting through the waves of the Irish Sea, 
Titanic rounded the Cornish coast and the Lizard, so familiar to the sailing veterans that stocked the ship's bridge, and then, heading east nor east, she was gliding through the English Channel. With the sun setting, Plymouth and then Weymouth slipped by until Titanic slowed at the entrance to the Solent that would bring her into the dock at Southampton. Under cover of darkness, late on the night of the 3rd, the Southampton Harbour pilot was brought on board to guide the ship down the narrow channel and then in towards the White Star Dock at berth 44. Early in the morning of the 4th, the manoeuvre was pulled off and Titanic was quietly and unceremoniously docked. For the first and last time, her mooring lines and hawsers were looped around the bollards that ran the length of the new dock, and there, as the sky turned murky as the sun slowly rose, Titanic sat gleaming. As a salute to Southampton, her new home, Titanic was dressed fore to aft with colourful signal flags that fluttered quietly in the breeze. Although from the outside, Titanic looked fresh and ready, there was still much business to attend to before she was ready for a maiden transatlantic voyage. Shortly after the arrival at Southampton, 2nd Officer Blair had instructed Lookout George Hogg to lock up the binoculars he had personally loaned the crew for use while at sea. With no use for binoculars while the ship was tied up, Blair offered Hogg his cabin key and instructed Hogg to secure the binoculars in a locker. Hogg did it and gave the key back to Blair. Now this quick exchange between the two men would become cemented in legend in the coming weeks, but for now, the exhausted crew on watch could get some respite before the week of preparations for passenger boarding began. Although she looked a fine sight, some of the Southampton citizenry might have felt a bit slighted. A custom had been skipped. Usually, a new ship would be open for inspection by the public for a nominal fee, with the profits being donated to seamen's charities, but that week, Titanic would be closed to guests instead. While Titanic's entrance had been grand, indeed, and many dozens of spectators came out to gawk up at her huge black hull and towering funnels in the dock, the ship had actually arrived in a period of some national turmoil. That week in April had brought a nationwide coal strike, affecting every shipping line, vessel and port in the country. In a bid to acquire a minimum wage, over a million coal miners had stopped work more than a month before, relying on union strike funds to supplement their income in the interim. The British economy suffered under the strain, Without access to the fuel that was at the heart of their industry, the nation seemed to come to a standstill. With little coal available, ships were taken out of service and scheduled sailings were cancelled. As they waited tied up by their dozens, crew members and staff were left without work or pay for the foreseeable future. But the White Star Line wasn't going to let Titanic get caught in the crossfire. Stockpiles of coal were allocated to the ship, and while she was being bunkered, other fleetmates were mothballed and their passengers were moved to the new ship's crossing. It prolonged the bunkering process, and because of that, the public inspections were cancelled. Coaling created massive quantities of dust that seemed to permeate deep within the ship's public rooms, much to the steward's dismay. Almost 200 passengers found themselves on board Titanic as a result of the strike, but despite the fraught situation and the uncertainty that surrounded Southampton and the shipping business as a whole, it was still imperative that Titanic make her maiden voyage on schedule. So coal, from ships that had been pulled from service and tied up, was transferred to the bunkers of Titanic, including some from her sister Olympic, and it was with this donated supply of coal that Titanic was to make her journey to New York. As bunkering went on, a few days after her arrival in Southampton, the coal strike officially ended with the passage of the Coal Miners Act, which extended minimum wage to the miners and saw all collieries in the UK back to full capacity that same week. It would still take time to fully recover from the coal deficits that resulted from the strike, but the shipping world and the UK at large could at last breathe a small sigh of relief, because the end was in sight. While the strike was finally over, many were still clamouring for work, and because of this, Titanic took on most of her crew on April 6th, the day the coal strike came to an end. From the city of Southampton came dozens and dozens. Firemen, trimmers, bakers, stewards. Southampton's terrace suburbs gave Titanic more than 720 of her 908 strong crew complement. They streamed aboard, presenting seamen's books and certificates for inspection and receiving rudimentary berthing within Titanic's labyrinthine interior. Their home for the next few weeks was very comfortable. The firemen, who would be working deep in the boiler rooms, which often ran as hot as 120 Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius, benefited from Thomas Andrew's goodwill and thoughtfulness. He had installed a drinking fountain for them along the route they would need to take to trundle down from their bunks every shift. For those happy few days at Southampton, Titanic stood tall and proud at her new dockside home, 
While her sailing day was indeed close at hand, these final days were vital for the ship's ultimate completion. Many of the furnishings in many second-class spaces still needed to be brought on board, and certain staterooms hadn't yet been completed. Crates of utensils, china and drinkware were still finding their way onto the ship, and Thomas Andrews spent hours ensuring that the ship was as close to perfect as possible. No issue was too small, from trouble with the restaurant's hot press, to the stain used on the ship's wicker furniture, to the number of screws used in the hat hooks found in staterooms. Andrews was personally inspecting all details of the ship down to the last rivet. But of course, he would concern himself with far more than just paint colour and counting screws. This was also a time of frantic activity within the Highland and Wolfe's facilities at Southampton, which was a special extension to the shipyard meant to service vessels without the need of a return trip to Belfast. This comparatively large facility housed almost everything needed to maintain and repair ships while they were still in the water. Engineering, carpentry, electrical and plating works were all available. Andrews would have been making extensive use of these facilities alongside numerous workers operating under his supervision. His secretary, James Hamilton, recalled Andrews' perfectionism during this time, saying he would himself put in their place such things as racks, tables, chairs, berth ladders, electrical fans, saying that except he saw everything right, he could not be satisfied. Above the dock level, crew carried crates and parcels aboard, while below them, workers from the R and JH Rear Company loaded in hundreds of tons of coal to fill the ship's cavernous bunkers. The Herculean task actually took place along both sides of the ship to allow for an even weight distribution, and it was notoriously backbreaking and dirty work. Buckets of coal were painstakingly hauled up one at a time with the help of little cranes called coaling outriggers, which swung out from the ship's promenade deck. Once a bucket of coal was hoisted all the way up the side of the ship, it was dumped into a chute leading to the coal bunker, and then the bucket was passed back down to the barges via the coaling outrigger, and the process was repeated. It took days for workers to complete this task, and by the end, over 5,800 tons of coal had been loaded in by hand. Surprisingly, this was still below the ship's total capacity, thanks mainly to the coal strike and its shortages, but still, she wouldn't be wanting fuel on this voyage, because once she reached New York, it was estimated she'd still have roughly 1,000 tons of coal in reserve. Then there came a shock to the ship's bridge crew. Rumours of a reshuffle proved true, and news was handed down of a sudden change in the ship's ranks. To get more experience into the bridge, Olympic's chief officer, Henry Wilde, was to step into the same position on Titanic. This meant that the senior officers already assigned to their roles would need to adjust down in order to accommodate the change. William Murdoch, originally appointed chief officer, would instead become first officer, with Lightoller now assuming the role of second, and no one was more affected by this change than the previous second officer, David Blair, who was now left with no assignment on the ship whatsoever. He would be unable to accompany Titanic on her maiden voyage, much to his dismay. He wrote a note home and said, This is a magnificent ship. I feel very disappointed I am not to make the first voyage. Lightoller was similarly discouraged by this turn of events, and later he recalled that it, quote, threw both Murdoch and me out of our stride, and apart from our disappointment of having to step back in our rank, it caused quite a little confusion. In the disorienting aftermath, Blair packed his things and he disembarked with both the key to his cabin and the binoculars and the key to the ship's crow's nest telephone still in his pocket. It was a disappointing turn of events for Blair, but ultimately it was one that would probably save his life. On April 6th, Titanic began to take on the supplies she needed to feed and care for her hundreds of passengers, as well as the cargo being carried to New York. The ship's electric cranes got to work lowering bags and bags of cargo and crates deep down into the ship from her well deck after they were hoisted up from the dock below. Everything from cases of orchids and toothpaste, lace cotton and tulle, bags of rubber and rolls of linoleum. The Aero Club of America was shipping over a large case of machinery that likely contained at least some of the components of an airplane. One passenger, William Carter, was shipping home a shiny new town car a 25 horsepower Renault. Carter was an avid car enthusiast, and for the voyage he'd be joined by his chauffeur. Into the dozens of specialist pantries and storage rooms were loaded tons and tons of food and provisions for the ship's 2200 strong complement. There were 75,000 pounds, over 35 tons of fresh meat, 11,000 pounds of fish, 40,000 eggs, 36,000 apples, and 40 tons of potatoes for a start. Into the bars and cellars were sorted 12,000 bottles of beer and stout, 
1,500 bottles of wine and champagne, and 850 bottles of spirits. Into her stores were neatly folded 45,000 linen napkins and 6,000 damask tablecloths. As the buzz of activity continued, the White Star Line took the opportunity to freshen Titanic's exterior up. Her departure and arrival would be extensively photographed by the press, and she had to be looking her best. On Monday, April 8th, Titanic's funnels were given a fresh lick of paint, and photographers from one end of the dock captured dramatic photographs of the crew rappelling down from the painter's lines, which were run from the top of the funnels, five stories up in the air. Deep down in the ship's boiler rooms, preparations were made to light the main boiler furnaces. In just 48 hours from the 8th, Titanic would need to supply 215 pounds per square inch of hot steam to her engines. To reach those kinds of pressures, it would take the better part of the next day to adequately heat the boilers, reach an efficient burn, and then turn the water to steam. Even though the ship was not yet at sea, the stokers already began their hot and dirty work, shoveling in loads of coal drawn from far and wide, and keeping an eye on their pressure gauges. Tuesday, April 9th, the final day before Titanic would set out on her maiden voyage. The Board of Trade Emigration Officer, Maurice Clark, had arrived to inspect the ship's safety equipment one final time. Clark was considered something of a nuisance by the crew members that knew him because of his stringent attitude and his uncompromising nature. Ever the character, Lightoller seemed to be no fan of the highly demanding process, remembering that Clark required every life preserver, lifeboat, davit, tank, breaker and oar thoroughly tested and accounted for. As the final day of preparations drew to a close, Captain Smith joined his family at their home, known as Woodhead, in Southampton's Portswood suburb. This precious visit, after weeks spent getting Titanic ship shape, offered the 62-year-old commander the chance to enjoy a final night home with his wife and 12-year-old daughter Helen. Word had somehow got out that Smith planned to retire. The New York Times had reported the story in June 1911, but just before Titanic sailed from Southampton, the White Star Line clarified that Smith would stay on with the line until Titanic was superseded by an even bigger, finer ship, probably Britannic. By delaying the clarification until the last minute, it's probable that the White Star Line hoped to draw out some of Smith's loyal passengers who'd jump at the chance for a final crossing with their favourite captain. That night, the family settled in, and Smith wouldn't be back home for another two weeks yet. Aboard Titanic, Thomas Andrews penciled a final letter to Nellie back in Belfast. The Titanic is now about complete, he said, and will, I think, do the old firm credit tomorrow when we sail. After a flurry of inspections, trials, last minute changes, multiple delays and finishing touches, dawn broke on April 10th, 1912. All the deadlines had been met, and Titanic was finally ready to set out from her home port. She sat low in the water, her holds loaded with hundreds and hundreds of tons of cargo and provisions. The weather was mild and slightly overcast, and the ship stood proud, a thing of beauty against the Southampton skyline. The liner's berth nearby seemed tiny by comparison from a totally different era. Titanic was as ready as she could ever be. Much of the ship's crew came aboard from about 6am, preparing for the crew muster and lifeboat drills that would need to take place. By 7.30am, the crew was joined by Captain Smith after he arrived from Woodhead, as well as Maurice Clark, who was to oversee the final drills before departure. The crew was mustered, and then summarily brought through a battery of health inspections, roll call and head counts before finally being released to their duties. Clark also oversaw a final pre-departure lifeboat drill, as two starboard side boats were loaded and lowered to his satisfaction. With that, he left the ship. Of course, much of the activity surrounding Titanic that April morning concerned not her crew, but the hundreds of passengers excitedly descending upon the White Star dock. Many passengers had reached the dock by way of boat trains, which were specially arranged from Waterloo Station in London to the docks in Southampton in a trip lasting under two hours. The boat trains departed London that morning, one for second and third class passengers and another for first. Boarding the first class boat train that morning was Father Francis Brown, an avid amateur photographer, and as the trains pulled in near the dock, passengers eagerly craned their necks to get a good view of the massive ship that they were about to board, her gleaming golden funnels peeking above the sheds at the dock. Father Brown, along with his friend Tom Brownrigg, found his way from the boat train to one of the ship's gangways, deposited his luggage, and passed through the usual ticket inspections, and prepared to step aboard. But then Brown sensed another photo opportunity. He paused halfway up the gangway and snapped a spectacular photograph, this time of Titanic herself, 
in her riveted side towering like a giant black cliff face as it dwarfed the landscape around her. For many passengers like Brown, the experience of viewing the liner close up like this was a thrill unlike any other. As Titanic stood proud, her hull shining with fresh paint and her silhouette a marvel to the enthusiastic crowd waiting to board, it's easy to argue that Titanic never looked more beautiful than she did the morning of April 10th, 1912. From between the wisps of cloud, the spring sun peeked out and beat down upon her decks and the dock, warming the hundreds of people that hurriedly passed through the lines of inspections to get on board. First class passengers calmly walked up the gangways into B deck to be greeted by the curling oak banisters of the grand staircase, or further down below on D deck by the airy elegance of the reception room's entrance. Second class passengers boarded further aft into the promenade on C deck, while far below them third class passengers streamed into the maze-like, white painted corridors down on E deck. For many of these men, women and children, there was a symbolic gesture that gave them a glimpse at new lives ahead of them. At Titanic's masthead fluttered the stars and stripes, a customary destination flag. There could be no doubt where Titanic was headed. For those who built her, this was the payoff for untold hours of backbreaking labour. For those who served on her, Titanic was meant to be the highlight of their career, a posting that any sailor would be honoured to undertake. For her passengers, she was a ticket to a brand new life, a new business venture, or a well-earned holiday, a symbol of wealth, and status, a sparkling, towering monument to Edwardian daring do. This was Titanic in her brief but illustrious prime, a ship untouched by tragedy, ready to set off into the horizon toward a bright and prosperous future. With one long blast, her voice boomed and echoed out across the tiled rooftops of the town. The mooring ropes were cast off and Titanic was ready to go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.